I'm Jane Goldman, and I'm investigating the paranormal. Tonight, I'm trying to discover the truth about aliens. Perhaps there are aliens disguised as people. If their technology is very good, we simply would not know. We're all too familiar with eyewitness accounts of UFO sightings and alien abductions. We've all seen the blurry photographs and the wobbly home videos that claim to show flying saucer activity. And we're all aware of the assertions by the believers that there's an official cover-up in operation. So I was determined that this investigation was going to be more ambitious. I wanted to find out if there was any hard evidence of any alien activity here on Earth. So I headed across the Atlantic to America for my first case. 5,000 feet up at the edge of the Rocky Mountains in the American Midwest is the border between Utah and Colorado. It's a place with a few small towns and huge empty areas of sparse desert. It's also an alien hotspot, an area where it's common to hear reports of sightings. But one man's story is different from all the rest. I waited on a lonely road on the Colorado border where I'd arranged to meet Bob White. He was a man with a unique story. Bob had promised to take me to the spot where his alien encounter had happened. Bob White was a successful country singer touring the USA. One summer night, he was driving to Las Vegas with a girlfriend. At about 2 a.m., they crossed the border from Utah into Colorado. Then, just up ahead, they both saw what seemed like a huge and brilliant light beside the road. Bob persuaded his girlfriend to pull over, even though she was terrified. Bob got out and walked up the dusty slope to try to discover the source of the light. But when he reached the top, the light became so intense that he had to shield his eyes. And at that moment, whatever was causing it took off at high speed and shot up into the night sky. That all sounded like just another encounter, but the thing that made Bob's story different was that whatever had caused the blinding light had left something behind when it took off. Bob had found a piece of physical evidence to back up his story, and that made his case unique. She and I were driving this uh, road, it was late at night, so at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, it was very, very dark. This is, this is pretty close to the spot right here. This looks like it. There the light was, up here. And it was as huge as a three-story building or a, a large barn. And it just so bright you couldn't look at it. I had to shield my eyes like this to look at it. Couldn't tell if there was anything solid inside it or not. And we were standing here and the light was shining over the top and I couldn't see the bottom of it and uh, I thought well I'm gonna see these big halogen lights and I'm gonna see mining equipment uh -huh. but there were no halogen lights and there was no mining equipment and as we were watching it it just straight up in the air just as fast as my eyes could follow it and then it connected to two other lights like two blue neon tubular lights with a space in between, and then went out of sight. And then I watched it, and I saw it come back down again, and I thought it was the same thing coming back at me. And I saw it where it hit the ground here. When I followed the light, the ridge in the ground, this is what I came up with. No, that's extraordinary. So this just came out of the big light? Yes, it did. Did you 
touch it right away. No, it was glowing hot. I nudged it with my, my, with my foot. Right. I went back to the car to find something to pick it up with. Yeah. I sure wasn't going to leave it here after I saw it. Or by the time I come back, it had cooled down. So right away, you felt you were right in the middle of something. Right. Extraordinary. Actually, it happened so fast that uh, I didn't have much time to feel anything, except that I knew that something hit the ground and I wanted to find out what it was. And my first thought when I saw this was, gosh, this is part of history. So I picked it up, took it back to the car, put it in the trunk, and we were on our way. The object Bob had recovered from the UFO encounter was made from some sort of metal, but felt much heavier than it looked. It was strangely beautiful and like nothing else I'd ever seen before. But I knew if I wanted to find out more about the object and its origins, it was gonna have to be scientifically tested. Back in the car, Bob continued his story. After their encounter, Bob and his friend drove to Cisco, the nearest town about 15 miles further south. Since that night, a freeway has been built that bypasses Cisco. Now that the main road no longer passes by, the town that Bob and his girlfriend visited has become a ghost town. This was a cafe. This was where we stopped to get a cold drink. There were two prospectors sitting at the table. They overheard us talking because we were both pretty excited about it. And they come up and ask us, you folks saw something tonight, didn't you? And I said, yeah, we saw some lights. I didn't tell him about the object. And he said, did you report it? And I said, no, I didn't. I don't know who to report it to and why would I? He said, we see them here every night. And he said, we report them and they don't investigate. Maybe coming from an outsider, they may investigate. And I said, well, I wouldn't know who to tell. And he gave me a phone number. He said, call this number. The number he dialed was for the nearby Green River Air Force Base, which is known today as the New Area 51. But the duty sergeant who answered the call seemed unimpressed with Bob's report. He blew me off. He said, well, what you saw was probably some reflections of headlights or uh, swamp gases or, or, or ball lightning. And uh, he wasn't interested in it. So I wasn't either. Did you tell him about the object? No. Why did you not tell him? Because I didn't want anybody to call me a UFO nut. Right. That's why, because my career was going real good. The object remained with Bob's sister while Bob concentrated on his singing career. When she died in 1998, Bob rediscovered the alien object and decided he now had time to investigate it further. After the break, I meet the experts who believe alien scientists are using our farm animals for their experiments. Sometimes the ear's gone, the tongue's removed, glands, yeah. eyes removed. Bob White had had an amazing encounter which had left him with a unique piece of physical evidence. In the years since Bob found the alien object, he had not gone public because he was uneasy about the reaction of others. Even now, it was important to him that we believed he was telling the truth, so he suggested undergoing a polygraph lie detector test to prove that his account of events was accurate. Scott Stoneburner carries out lie detector tests for the state police department and he performed the test on Bob in his motel room. Hey Bob. Scott, polygraph examiner. Nice to meet you, sir. Polygraph tests work by monitoring small changes in the heart rate and breathing rhythm that are caused by the stress of telling lies. In America, they're regularly used by police departments for testing suspects' alibis. That's about as tight as it's going to get right there, Bob. Is that, is that, is that Yep. Is that comfortable? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Scott went through the standard interrogation procedure which involved asking the same simple sets of questions three times. Is your last name White? Yes. 
Before 1980, did you ever lie to a person in a position of authority? No. Regarding the object you found near Grand Junction in the 1980s, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Regarding the object you found near Grand Junction in the 1980s, are you lying about how you found that object? No. Okay, Bob, I need you to sit quietly for a few more seconds. This third test was over. After the test was completed, Scott let me know that there had been no significant fluctuations in Bob's heart rate or respiration, which meant that according to the polygraph, Bob had been telling the truth about how he found the object. After the polygraph reconfirmed Bob's story, I needed to switch my attention to the object itself. First step would be to find somewhere that could tell us something new about the object. I knew it had undergone several tests already. It had even been examined by the government at the Los Alamos laboratory, but all the tests had been inconclusive. But things aren't always the way they seem. Bob was told by the government that their tests didn't come up with anything that suggested an extraterrestrial connection. But they have kept part of the object with no explanation. If it's just an ordinary lump of metal, why did they decide to keep a sample of it? It's the sort of behavior that fuels conspiracy theories. While I was considering the problem, I got a call from one of Bob's colleagues who told me he had some documents that I might find interesting. Dr. Gilbert Jordan had at one time been a scientist working on classified US government projects. He showed me his Area 51 security pass, and he'd also obtained some military papers that seemed to suggest that Bob's object might not be unique after all. In 1944, as World War II came to a close, a British Spitfire flying over Germany was shot down by what seemed to be a UFO. The pilot was killed and the plane crashed in Denmark. Inside the damaged plane, they found a metal object very similar to Bob's. These are actually uh, pictures that are come off the uh, Army Fort Belvoir website. So this is an extraordinary document. It says War Department Official Business. It's an official document that was released under Freedom of Information Yes, Act. and this is from the Counterintelligence Corps. This is the first uh, time that I ever heard that there was an aggressive action by a Foo Fighter or a, a UFO. When they recovered it, they saw a great big gaping hole in the Spitfire. And the only way it could have been produced is like a shape charge would hit it. And then at the, in the back of the plane, which they found which was crashed, they found an object. And the object was approximately the same size as Bob White's object. The color was slightly different. It was kind of a copperish, uh, titanium type hue to it. But it had the same type of chads that uh, Bob White's object had. The documents Dr. Jordan had found were remarkable and seemed to prove that the government had seen at least one other object like Bob's. The military had apparently decided their object had an alien connection. So why not Bob's? Or did someone know something that they were trying to hide? It was a difficult and slow process, trying to find an open-minded scientific institution prepared to carry out the new tests on Bob's alien object. While I waited for responses, I decided to search for evidence in Britain, in an area where, according to some theories, the action of the Earth's magnetic field has created a 40-mile-wide UFO corridor which stretches from Whitby in the east across the Pennines to Liverpool in the west. Todmorden in Yorkshire is one of the most active areas in Britain for claims of alien visitation. Like Colorado, it's a center for sightings, but also for what's become known as animal mutilation. According to some, these seemingly random and unexplained attacks on farm animals are connected with alien activity. Sheep farmer Sue Ryder has suffered a series of sheep mutilation incidents on her farm. My family's farmed here for over a hundred years and never had anything like it. So what happened that morning? Well, a sheep obviously dead with part of its face missing 
and totally cleaned out inside. Um, the tendons were totally intact. It was a constant cut all down the face and right angles along the jawline. There was no ripped skin, but it was the, um, the precision of the cutting which was quite amazing. And the depth of the cut was the same the whole way along, all round by its ear and its eye, tongue, everything was missing within that. But there was no, no wool, no blood. We looked at it really in amazement, in, you know, that it, something like that had happened overnight. And you think about a fox and the badger. Yeah. Um, and obviously it wasn't that because there was no tearing. What do you think did it? No idea. No idea at all. Can't think of any animal that could have done um, done the injury. And um, I'm open to suggestion. When Mrs Ryder discovered the dead sheep, she contacted an organisation called the Animal Pathology Field Unit, who advertised in the Farmer's Guardian. Run by a retired scientist, David Caton, the group examines mutilation cases all over Britain. They say there's a pattern to these mutilations that rules out the notion that they're the result of random predator attacks, and in fact suggests a systematic experimental programme carried out by visitors from another planet. There's usually about five or six type of things that happen on a regular basis, a repeated pattern if you like. And the most common thing is the jaw strip, exposing clean bone. Sometimes the ear's gone, the tongue's removed, usually from the back. Glands. Glands. Yes. Eyes removed, and the ears crop down to the scalp, which is a common thing. So the this would be a typical case? Typical case, yes. There was no other injuries on the animal. The, other than the, the head, the, the face and the jaw. Right. So we're talking about clean cuts here, that's what you're yes. looking for, isn't yes, it? Yes, generally clean cuts, yeah. Slaughtermen say to clean bone down, to clean jaw, I think the best case is probably, yeah, this one. To get the jaw clean like this and to peel the skin back, mm. uh, they, they say normally you would need steam, you know, high heat. You've managed to draft in uh, medical professionals to give their opinion as well, I understand. Yes, certainly one gentleman who was, I'm very lucky that uh, he was showed interest and was willing to do it. He's a professor of pathology and he looked at six lambs uh, which he couldn't identify the cause of death, but he knew the animals were actually dead before the mutilations took place. He identified in some cases a knife, a, a thin blade had been used to separate the vertebrae to take the head off and the blade had gone through the what they call the IV joint in the in the spine, the intervertebral disc uh, and uh, it had precisely cut through that position without you know that making damage. I was shocked at what Caden had said. It certainly seemed that the removal of the head from the spine with such surgical precision would surely require medical training and controlled laboratory conditions. So did he feel that it had been caused by an individual with some kind of medical skill or...? Well, obviously he would have to have a medical training to have done it. Uh, it would be very impractical to carry out these sorts of procedures in an open field without a firm base and good lighting and because they often tend to disappear at night or they're found first thing in the morning so it suggests it's an overnight operation but then for someone, a human being, to have done that, to take the animal away and perform these sort of ritualistic type wounds, some people might say uh, and then return the carcass back to the scene of the crime, doesn't make any sense, particularly that they're quite remote region some of these places are fine, quite difficult places to get to in a vehicle. I'm going to ask, I mean if we're to take on board the hypothesis that this is being perpetrated by people from other planets, is this what we're talking about? Mm. Um, why? Uh, I've thought for a long time it's to do with uh, monitoring for pollutions which is to suggest that they're looking at uh, the uh, contamination we are occurring on this planet due to chemistry we apply into the fields, fertilizers, 
that's the animals ingesting. Apparently they can tell a lot from the health of the animal by looking at tongue tissue. But they're obviously examining life on this planet and they're looking at all life forms and we've had mammals, mutilated seals, dolphins, dolphins birds, even the predators. Chillingly, Caton said he had evidence of these kind of experimental injuries being found on all kinds of species, not just farm animals. But I wanted to know if there had ever been a case where a human corpse had been found with the same kind of telltale mutilations. And I was shocked to discover a case that was virtually identical. On September 29th, 1988, the body of a man was found near to the Guarapihangua Reservoir, which supplies water to the Brazilian city of Sao Paulo. The corpse was taken to the local pathology lab, where a post-mortem revealed that most of the man's internal organs had been removed seemingly through small holes in his body. His face had the same jaw strip removal that I'd seen on the photographs of the mutilated sheep, and his eyes, ears and tongue had been removed in a way that also mirrored the evidence that Caton had shown me. If this man had in fact been a victim of an alien experiment, then we had far more to worry about than the fate of a few farm animals. My investigation continues after the break when the search for evidence of alien experimentation on humans brings me back to Britain.